Welcome to Stocks in Translation, Yahoo Finance's vodcast cutting through the mayhem, the noisy numbers, and hyperbole to give you the information you need to make the right trade for your portfolio. Today, I'm joined by Ben Emens. He is a senior portfolio manager at New Edge Wealth, along with our all-star producer, Sydney Freed. Uh, thank you both for joining us here today. And on the docket, we're going to be talking about the inflation eclipse, a story that never dies, never gets old, and our word of the day, resilience in the market earnings season, and even life. And this episode, by the way, is brought to you by the number 100 dollars, that is, dollars a barrel. Could geopolitical risk end up goosing black gold prices back up to triple digits? We're talking Brent, WTI. Ben, let's go beyond the noise. We want to talk some markets. And we're coming off a spate of strong economic data in the U.S. We just had ISM print above 50. That was a week or two ago. We had jobs a week or two just really accelerating to the upside. 300,000 payrolls, which you called, by the way. Um, but I, you got to think, are investors getting this wrong? Because it looks like things are getting stronger. This presents, this presents possibly a problem for the Fed. It could be, you know, it's a strong economy. So the, 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 the narrative now shifted to like, why should you cut rates in a strong economy? You cut rates typically when things go south, when things go bad. So I think the Fed can stay on hold here, but it has to watch what it's doing because even being on hold, you know, there was one Fed member last week, again, voicing the, the, the word hike, you know, and it's still on the table. And that, yes. I think, is not the narrative in the market. So if you're getting a strong economy and it continues and you have to bring in the hike idea again, I will really change sentiment. Yeah, well, let me just bring up Jamie Dimon, who just released his annual shareholder letter for JP Morgan. He thinks uh, rates are going to 8%, and the tenure, tenure, the tenure yield right now is at something like 4.45%, so not even quite at 4.5%, but it's been up to 5 He thinks it's going to 8 That is substantially higher than anybody's pricing in. Um, what do you think about that coming from the most important banker in the world? It's definitely to take note of because, you know, these numbers are, let's say, long-term averages for the 10 year. You know, if you go back to the, to the 1600s until now, the average is about 7.5%, 8% in that range. So That's you, a long time. A <laughs> very long time. <laughs> but you would, what we call mean revert, right? So meaning mm -hmm. like you go back to the average. Um, why would this be possible? You know, we do have a deficit problem and, and we're not getting out of it. Amazingly, with a strong economy, we're not actually narrowing it because we just don't have enough tax revenues. And we're spending far more than what we've ever done in the past. So this will at some point have to be reconciled, either change the whole course of fiscal policy or let the market sell itself out. This is what Jamie, Jamie Dimon is really talking about. There will be at some point a new equilibrium in interest rates where people say, I want more yield for all this deficit risk. Yeah, it's always when we're searching for that new equilibrium that things tend to go haywire. But you look like you had a question. Well, I was going to say, is Jamie Dimon the only one with that kind of call? I don't, I don't know anybody else just, of his stature yeah. that has an 8% handle on the tenure. Do you? Not 8%, but you had Bill Ackman last year. Really 6%, maybe. Yeah, he was making those cases, and then he backed away from it when he saw that, that he thought it was high enough, <laughs> right? As, yeah. you know, a trader, well, right? <laughs> you know, you got to talk your book for a while, and when the yeah. market comes in line with your book, you shut up. That's the way it works. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, we're talking yields and stocks and all this kind of stuff, and mm -hmm. I know you always have questions for us based on uh, your, your uh, armchair yeah, work. I'm thinking, so why is it, explain yields and stocks essentially, like why is it price up, yield down? So I in think bonds that's question. then, yeah. so you have bonds which are inversely yeah. correlated with yields. Uh, so you talk about bond prices, when the, people are buying bonds, that means the yield goes down. Your explanation. Yeah, it's very called a teeter totter. You know, oh, teeter -totter. I love right. that. It's not yes. tater tot, teeter totter. Teeter totter. Yes. You know, it's like the idea that that yes, it's math really, but you know, if you if you <laughs> if your yield goes up, you know, you, you're going to be uh, having you know more interest to earn in the future, but it is discounted over time. That's why a bond is a cash flow, and that leads you to a lower price in the future. That's sort of the, 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 the math behind it. So yes, you should buy bonds when yields go up and then mm -hmm. you earn more interest. And then eventually, if, if the economy goes a different direction, gets weaker, then that high yield will be your return and you make that back into the price. 
Yeah, and I think it's important to understand that there are different buyers of bonds all around the world. If we're just talking about U.S. government bonds, you might have uh, U.S. individual retail investors buying through Treasury Direct. They have investment directives, directives of their own. Mm -hmm. You might have Japanese uh, people, not so much anymore, but historically when we have infer interest rate differentials such that the U.S. is paying a lot more money on bonds, people overseas will want to invest in the U.S. Mm -hmm. bonds. So when yields here get to a certain level, even though that means that the price of the bond is going down when it yeah. when it hits that level um, automatically people say okay I should be buying some of that so three percent four percent five percent correct me if I'm wrong here uh, but that's I think basically the way it works all right now we want to get to our word of the day this is resilience and this is not just about the persistently high GDP that we've seen uh, that could be characterized as resilient the US economy uh, not just about sticky inflation and not just the machinations of Jay Powell and Colette the Fed. Uh, we want to talk about interest rates and company earnings because company earnings have been very resilient recently. We have climbed out of an earnings recession last year, I believe. And uh, where do you see? We're heading into big bank earnings season. What's your outlook? So right now, we're still having sort of a year-on-year -year negative growth rate, apparently, in, in earnings. That's if you take everything if, if you strip out the max seven, which is really high growth rate, right? And you, earn, and you end up with this negative rate, but the forecast then starts to improve. In fact, actually, it's really interesting. My, my colleague was showing me this graph that um, it starts to really broaden out. At least the analysts expect that the earnings will improve from, from a negative 3% to plus 10% to plus 15, 20 in the following quarters. I think that's really your expectation about that resilient economy mm -hmm doesn't get thrown off course. It no. sounds like we're at the beginning of this cycle. So it's not even like we're in the middle and wondering, are we going to inflect up or down? There's going to be some potential momentum to the upside then. That's what you would expect? Yeah, that's 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 what it looks like. And to an extent, we've had a bit of a preview of it in the market since the October lows, where we had a real momentum building. But we haven't seen the major rotation out of, out of these mega seven stocks just yet. I mean, some in the banks yeah. or in the energy, mm -hmm. but not major. Like so, that's I think next when those earnings come out in the future. Okay, so uh, I, I was looking at the sector action year to date. Energy now, the number one sector, but we also have industrials creeping up. That's a cyclical play. We also have materials, that's a cyclical play. Financials, which is value in cyclicals. Um, what of these groups, like we're waiting, I mean, we've seen a broadening out, but what are we waiting for? Like, is there an all clear signal where everybody's finally on the same team? I have an answer for that because I've been in this business long enough, but your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think people are watching the, the data, obviously, of the, the economy. And what's interesting, those groups that you mentioned, every one of these data points have been really strong. When you look at manufacturing data, durable goods data, auto production data, that's all linked into that those groups that have rallied over time. But I think what people are quote, waiting for still is that the real green light, as in green where we are right now, is obviously what the Federal Reserve will do. You know, if this is an economy that expands in supply, as Powell says, and it will bring ultimately prices down, the green light really for that rally is that rate cut that the Fed can deliver as it has reached its inflation goal. I think that's what people are still waiting for. Yeah, and when the Fed starts, I think it's important to differentiate too. The Fed can cut rates proactively as a kind of an insurance, or it can be reactive. In other words, historically, they've seen, okay, we got the economy wrong. Things are deteriorating quickly. We need to cut by 50 basis points. We need to cut, you know, four rate cuts today. That's much different than these proactive rate cuts that I think we're talking about now. Yeah, that's exactly the right word, proactive. And the reason why it's proactive is because if you get inflation further down towards where the Fed target is and you will not be cutting rates, you could actually have the situation of the complete opposite of what we've been the through. The spiral, last, the right? deflationary spiral. Exactly, you get to go to the downside and then you end up in a really bad situation where the Fed has no choice but to slash rates. So being proactive is mm -hmm. in putting one, two rate cuts yeah. ahead of that event happening should you should keep you from that say that abyss so to speak in in prices and that you know that's yeah. that's why they want to uh, achieve they want to do that now will they they're currently kind of on the whole holding patterns we were talking about because of the economy being that strong that there's no need for it but they're watching it obviously on both mm -hmm. sides you know if, if inflation starts to pick up again they may mm -hmm. have to hike 
But conversely, if you're having a situation where things turn the other direction... Binary situation, yes. Very binary. So, so if they cut in June, you consider that a proactive cut because the economy is still doing well? Yeah, and, and in fact, now in the market, people have expectations that that probability is less than 50% in yeah. June. Yeah. On the basis of all the strong data, so if they were to go ahead in June, markets will take it like, hmm, you're throwing a little heat here on the fire, <laughs> I, right? I, you <laughs> wrote <you> something, do this. <laughs> I just want to bring up, you wrote something really interesting in one of your newsletters that I want to bring up, and that's, you know, when we talk about central banks in the Fed, we got to consider that there are other central banks in the world and that this is an entire ecosystem. And uh, you were saying in one of your newsletters how the ECB could actually cut first, and that could potentially, if I'm reading this right, take pressure off of the Fed. Um, how That's something I hadn't considered before. So how explain that dynamic for us. Right. So if you look at the, since the pandemic, that all the central banks followed each other almost Syn in a synchronized way. Mm -hmm. Everybody had to ratchet up the, the policy rate much higher than they have ever done over the last 20 years and much faster. So emerging markets were first to do that. Mm -hmm. And once they sort of did that, they were able to lower rates exactly for similar reasons, somewhat proactive because inflation started to come off in emerging markets. But in the developed markets, Europe, US, Japan, mm -hmm. we haven't gotten to that point yet. So now the ECB seems to be much more in that position to do so. They have this meeting this week, by the way. They will likely signal strongly that they will go ahead and lower rates in June. And that does take the pressure off the markets of everybody's expectations. Because once one central bank like that goes ahead with lowering rates, there will be others that will follow. That has mm -hmm. been historically that way. Mm -hmm. And that's really because these economies are so linked to each other that if the ECB is in a position to lower rates because the economy is weak enough that the that prices are moderating, then the Fed will eventually follow too. All right, we got to pause for a quick break here. So for our viewers on streaming platforms, we're going to take a quick break. And for everybody else, we're going to carry on with the show here. Sid, you look like you had a question on the tip of your tongue. I, I wasn't a question. I was going to state for the record that <laughs> I would like the Fed to cut in May for the drama. Oh, wow. I, I, want, I want everyone to be shocked. I want us to like not have the full screen prepped or whatever. And when the Dow says, is down yeah, 1,500 okay, well, points, I can just show you the screen yeah, and say it's Sid's fault. And say it, my right money's here. draining from my account. All right, all right. But I, I, li I like the drama of a surprise cut. We got you. Cut. We might well, get some drama. Yeah. Well, it really plays into the idea of sell a May and mm -hmm. go away. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, recover Go far away. And sell a May and go away. <laughs> All right, uh, now it's time to get technical on some definitions here that we call jargon busters. And today we're going to take a look at net interest margin. And according to Investopedia, net interest margin is a measure of the difference between the interest rate paid and the interest rate received. And this is adjusted for the total amount of interest generating assets held by the bank. So basically, banks try to borrow at low rates. They try to lend at a higher rate and they pocket the difference. Um, so what, what, this is kind of a cyclical phenomenon. So where are we in the business cycle and what's happening with net interest margin now and going short term into the future? So it's amazing that the net interest margin has been fairly stable, even though the yield curve is in you now the, the term structure of interest rates is in two year, five year, 10 year, mm -hmm. 30 It's been inverted for over exactly. 18 months. Yeah. The longest inversion we've had since the 1980s. People have always connected the inversion of the yield curve with a narrowing interest rate margin. But I think what banks have been able to do is that they earn a lot of interest on short dated assets, securities or, or, or deposits. Um, and as a result, have been able to sustain that margin while there's a lot of loan demand in the economy because the economy is good and that, that spread is relatively stable. And, and I think for the yield curve is therefore not mattered at this point. At some point it will, mm -hmm. but banks have always been able to capitalize on that too. Once the yield curve becomes normally slow, like positive slope, then banks would probably buy longer dated assets and earn that yield and have you know, the remainder of the passes pay out at a very low interest and make money that way. So I think they've been pretty smart about how to manage it. But that it is a a, uh, a cyclical phenomenon is clear, yes. you know, because it will change. Like, so the margins could actually Actually, if you're getting a normal yield curve, it probably will widen the, the net interest margins. All right, something to pay attention to as we get these big bank earnings starting later this week. And now, yes? Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, I know Delta is Wednesday and Delta's yes. big, but bank earnings are always 
first, first ish. Why? Why? <laughs> I mean, back in the day, it was Alcoa, Best? which was an aluminum. Is an Alcoa? aluminum. Alcoa. Alcoa was number one, just because they were number one. It has. To, I, look, banks are huge entities, and they're reporting on a quarter which just ended basically ten days ago yeah. for them, not even ten business days. So that's incredibly short. They have the resources to do this. I think it's just because yeah. they're so big and yeah. you know on their game. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's really sort of more of a, I call it like a red herring yeah. idea. Mm -hmm. Like is in, you know, there's a calendar issue here. Yeah, the smaller lame. companies get up to 90 days, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And big guys go pretty quickly. I don't know. Well, it's also board driven, right? I mean, companies can make a decision when to report, you know, that's, that's you know, there has been companies who either, they also, by the way, make a decision whether they would give guidance on future earnings. Yeah. Right? We've had for some companies not giving guidance for some time because of the pandemic. Yes. Others have given Point. guidance much sooner. So that matters, I think, too. Mm -hmm. I'm not otherwise sure why the yeah. banks are first, but everybody's looking at the banks first. And it, it, maybe with the way it is, it's like as the banks goes, the, the rest of the earnings yeah. season goes. I mean, they are definitely in the, on, in, in the big attention right now because they have there's a lot of market activity happening. Yeah, for sure. So their, their results are probably going to be strong. Yeah, from reads on the consumer to uh, the M&A market, mm -hmm. uh, IPOs, everything. All right, we got to move on here. This episode brought to you by the number 100, and that refers to dollars a barrel. That is the WTI price. And this is a number that has woven its way through the financial fabric of the space-time continuum recently as the debate about $100 crude oil returns to the fore. We're talking about the impact of geopolitics and oil, like most commodities, is mean reverting. So it's range-bound. And most of the price activity that we've seen in WTI over the last year has been from the mid-60s to the low 90s, so maybe $25 a barrel. But what happens if we see WTI and Brent ticking higher? 85 for WTI, Brent 90. Another $10, we're talking about $100 oil. How does that change the game? I want to end the psychological, as in, you know, this is an important milestone, mm -hmm. $100 barrel. It's like, you know, you can see the headlines in the newspaper. I'm picturing a barrel <laughs> right. with the Benjamin on top. Something yeah. like that, and, you know, and, and, and people will, will look at gas prices immediately, which, by the way, have also been on the rise yeah. nationwide. It's, it's up about 6% over the past month. And so I think that is, for that reason, um, it's not targeted by OPEC in mm. itself. They don't have put out a specific number. What is interesting from OPEC, maybe not as known, is that all these countries calculate the oil price where they break even mm -hmm. on, their, on their fiscal budget. Now that price, the fiscal break even price, is actually about $95 on average, hmm. currently across most OPEC members. So there's something about $100 a barrel that that's important to them. Um, you know, it, ultimately, it's all, the, the oil market is much about supply and inventory. And now, as we know, OPEC has been continue to cut production. Um, not everybody's complied with that, but they've been able to do it so far and keep it together. That's why the market has been pricing towards that $100 a barrel, as opposed to if they didn't, like, and they get all this discord with each other, then it would, that, that $100 a barrel would not be so likely. Yeah, and you're right. It, it is a lot about the headlines because anytime I see a hundred dollar barrel of oil, especially when it's been locked in a lower trading range, <laughs> well, it piques my attention as well. Um, I want to stick with commodities here and talk about gold oh. and um, something really interesting. Another thing I learned from your newsletter: you've been tracking the term structure of gold, not only in the futures market, but spot gold versus futures gold. And uh, just real quick, if you have a gold contract in the futures, let's say you want to invest in gold through the futures market, you're buying maybe December uh, tw 2024 delivery gold. That means gold that's going to be uh, delivered at the end of this year. Well, that's several months away. And so you're paying, uh, you have to store, somebody else has to store it in the interim. And so there's going to be a price there. Yeah. If you want to yeah buy it, you have to maybe borrow money. So there's a risk-free interest rate. And so storage costs and interest rates, risk-free interest rates, those play mathematically into these calculations of future prices. So what we're seeing now is an aberration. That's where the spot price, it looks to be climbing above the futures prices. And just explain how that, uh, what that means for us. Yeah, it's a very unique situation in, in the gold market. It happens a lot in oil mm -hmm. because of that it is ultimately really about supply. And as we know with gold, it has a very limited outstanding supply and mining activities have, have slowed down a lot and they haven't found much gold over the last couple of years. And China has been, one of the central banks has been on the physical gold market accumulating 
large volumes of gold. So that has driven up the spot gold price, the actual price that where you pay for physical gold. You you can actually go to 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 like gold exchanges or retailers, and if you're trying to buy gold, it's not that simple anymore, and that's that's it gets sold out really quick. So I think this back what we call backwardation is that's the term for it in 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 the, in the futures market when the, the 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 spot price gold is higher than futures. Mm -hmm. That's really I think there's just not enough gold supply available in the market and therefore you're getting a higher spot price. When you buy gold futures, what we were, you were saying earlier, someone literally has to store the gold for you somewhere. Well, what does it mean? Okay. Uh, Is so, it a piece of paper? So we've opened up a giant <laughs> yeah. can of worms. Yeah. If, you, if we can, Oopsie. if we had another three <laughs> yeah. hours, we could explain. Um, basically, <laughs> we don't, have, we don't have three hours. We don't have three hours. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Um, Short explanation. Um, is there a short explanation? The question, um, what was the question? Okay, if you buy, when you're buying right. gold oh, somebody, futures, is it gold that someone is storing for you or you're just buying something in the universe that... It's a, it's it's a, a theoretical it's calculation. A theoretical yeah. calculation. It's, a, it's, it's basically yeah. a promise, so to speak, on the future. Uh, promise, promise, promise. I want my gold bar of gold. And, and in the end... I promise it will be 2500 in the future. No. And, it's, <laughs> and it's paper gold and there's all kinds of nice conspiracy theories there, so we're just going to leave that yeah. where it is and not touch that. Um, oh, we have a fun segment before before we go. So at here at Stocks and Translation, we do like to roll out the red carpet, but no new movie stars today. No movie stars. We do have charts. Yes, we do have we a movie charts. star. <laughs> Along with a new spin on an old Hollywood <laughs> gossip segment, who wore it better? Ooh. And today we're zeroing in on Bitcoin and gold. That's right. The other Bitcoin. Don't write letters. Both the yellow metal and digital gold recently surged to fresh record highs, but each took a vastly different journey. Bitcoin, it peaked in late 2021, promptly shed over three quarters of value over the next year before furiously launching to record highs late last year. And we've seen it continue this year. Meanwhile, gold peaked in early in the event early in the pandemic, and this was a year before Bitcoin peaked. It spent over three years trying to punch through $2,100 per ounce. Max drawdown was only 22% in gold versus a 78% drawdown in Bitcoin. So the bottom line is both Bitcoin and gold, they rocketed from technical purgatory, but which one wore that better? Which one wore the breakout better? I think it was Bitcoin, mm. you know, because it's been, it was a, a, a currency with such a hibernation that they call it right. Oh, winter. A, winter. Of right, sorts. Exactly. <laughs> sleeping, in, in, you know, bear sleeping coming. In, in, in hibernation in the winter. Yes. And it awoke and suddenly, and it was all about that, you know, one, I guess. The it's exciting. Yeah, exciting. It's, it's, it's a recognition that technology is adopted more and more everywhere, and blockchain technology in this case. Um, and and they talk about when they say having health. Oh, that's a big one. Look at the previous havings; they've been tremendously <laughs> bullish. And yeah. I think the bottom line is, I got I got to vote with crypto too. Um, I I got to go with crypto because it's exciting. And gold. All right. So we're talking about a replacement currency. Some people talk about that. You don't want a lot of volatility, so that's not a that's not necessarily a feature. You probably want something with less volatility, like gold. Nevertheless, uh, we do look like we have to go go here. So we got to say thank you for Ben. Ben, thank you for joining us here today. Sydney, as thank always, and we will see you, you another day. That was Yahoo Finance's Stocks in Translation with our master stats guy, Jared Blickery. He knows how to cut through the headlines and noisy data points to give you the inside scoop. Now you know why the Fed has a 2% inflation target, but doesn't stop there. I've got some chatter of my own. Opening bid is the essential conversation for investors of all stripes before the opening bell on Wall Street. Think hot analyst calls, big interviews, fresh commentary, and fire takes on the stories leading the business world. Join me on opening bid at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.